Okay, now that you've got your head around Le Chatelier's principle, we can actually put it into practice and have a look at some graphs. Now, it's quite likely that it may come up uh, in one of your questions, either in the multiple choice side or in your structured questions, to have to ask, answer an equilibrium graph question. Now, let's have a look at the different types of graphs and the different changes that could happen that'll shape the lines in our graphs. So, let's have a jump straight into it. There's two types of graphs. One of them is a concentration graph. Now, a concentration graph tells us how much of each substance there is on the y-axis and, of course, against time. So it's like a story of how much of each stuff there is. So as many components in the reaction as there are, I mean, as many substances, nitrogen, hydrogen, ammonia, for example, in this, in, in this one, um, there will be as many lines. So there's three substances in this reaction, therefore we're expecting three lines, one for each concentration. So when this, when this graph uh, rolls out, you'll get something like this where our two reactants, namely nitrogen and hydrogen, are being used up and ammonia is being formed. So the nitrogen and hydrogen lines are coming down, as you can see, and meanwhile ammonia is coming up. And at this point, initiated by the arrow there, we reach equilibrium for the first time. How do you know? Because the lines go flat and things balance out doesn't mean the reaction stopped, it just means that the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. Now what you've got to be able to interpret with a graph or predict is what will happen when a disturbance occurs. So let's say that at that particular time, time t for instance, time t, something happens. So in this case, we're going to add some more nitrogen. That is going to cause the nitrogen line to spike up radically. Okay, of course, according to Le Chatelier's principle, it's now going to try and bring that down again. So it will respond by bringing the green line down. As the green line goes down, so the hydrogen has got to go with it, because the nitrogen and hydrogen will get used up together, and the ammonia will be produced. So we'll expect the blue line for hydrogen to go down, the green line to go down, and the yellow line to go up. Let's have a look and see. There we go. And of course, that then rolls out and establishes a new equilibrium a little bit down the way. So that's a concentration graph with a change in concentration. Now, there's another type of graph, which is a rate of reaction graph. So instead of looking at the components of the reaction, in other words, the substances, we're interested this time around in the actual reaction rates. How many cars are on the road, going back to that analogy. So in this case, there's only two options. It's either going forward or it's going backwards. And those are the two lines that we've got. So there's the forward reaction is generally indicated at the top and the reverse reaction at the bottom. So for example, like this. Once again, the forward reaction slows down, the reverse reaction speeds up, and they have got to reach that point, of course, where the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the reverse reaction. That is dynamic equilibrium. And so, of course, those two lines actually meet in the middle this time. And that's where our equilibrium is formed. Now, once again, let's consider the same disturbance to happen. We're going to add some more nitrogen. So at that time t, once again, we're going to add some more nitrogen. That is going to cause the forward reaction to get favored. Why? Because if we've added more nitrogen, then the reaction is going to be opposed that, to use it up. The way it's going to use it up is by favoring the forward reaction more than the reverse reaction. So our, our, our forward reaction is going to go up. That's going to cause a spike to the yellow line. And then, of course, once the reaction continues, it will be pulled down again, and the green one will catch up to establish a new equilibrium. So our graph after the addition will look something like that. Okay, so there'll be a, a spike in the one that um, has more substance added to it. So that's how those two graphs would be affected by a change in concentration. Let's have a quick look at the other changes you might encounter and see what those graphs might look like. So first of all, a concentration graph. This time, we're going to have a change in temperature, an increase in temperature. So as you can see, the delta H is negative. Therefore, that means that the forward reaction, if the delta H is negative, the forward reaction is 
exothermic. All right, so if we've increased the temperature, it's not going to want to do the exothermic because that's going to make it even hotter. It's going to want to do the endothermic reaction more. So it's going to favor the reverse reaction. Now, by favoring the reverse reaction, it's got to use up some of the ammonia. So the yellow line is going to go down, we'd expect, and the other two lines will go up. Let's see what happens. There you go. Yellow line goes down and we make more nitrogen and hydrogen. But take note that at this point, none of them immediately changed. They all sloped gently instead of any one of them having a big spike because nothing was added or subtracted at that particular point. Okay, so that's how you tell a temperature change is everything does change, but not with a big vertical spike, only with shallow gradient changes. All right. When we're looking at a rate graph for a temperature change, it's not dissimilar to the one that we looked at last time. One will go up and then come down a little bit. But this time, because we've heated things up, we've increased the temperature, both reactions will go up. So we've heated it up, that's going to favor both reactions, well it's going to increase the rate of both reactions, but the one that's favored is the reverse reaction, remember, the endothermic run, which is why that one comes all the way up to here, whereas the other one, if you can see the yellow line there, has come up to that point there. They have both gone up. This one I sometimes call a spike, and this one I call a step. And when you roll it out, you can see that that one starts there. So Take note, when there's a change in temperature, both will be changed, but one more than the other. All right. Change in pressure. Well, an interesting thing happens when we change the pressure when you've got a situation like this. Look, all of the react reactants and, and products are gases. That means when we crunch it down, when we change the pressure, um, what's going to happen? Let's say we increase the pressure. All of the concentrations are going to go up because it was squished. Okay, the pressure's increased, everything's gotten closer together, that, that's pushed the concentration of everything up in a little jump. So they all kind of do a little spike or a little step up and then obviously adjust appropriately. Now you're probably comfortable with the fact that if we've increased the pressure, which one's going to be favored? It's going to favor the forward reaction to produce less moles of gas. So we're going to get more NH3 and use up the other two. Okay, um, interestingly our rate graph is going to be quite similar to a change in temperature because both reactions get sped up by increasing the pressure. We're pushing everything to closer together so the reaction, uh, there's more effective collisions. But of course one is favored more than the other and in the same way we see the forward reaction being favored more than the other. So you get a spike and a step if you could think about it in that way. Both begin with S. All right. Last change we're going to have a look at is what happens if you add a catalyst. Well, we know it speeds up the reaction. An interesting thing, though, is that when you add a catalyst, you don't favor either reaction. It's like, imagine there's a highway and there's people going to work and going home on the highway. And traffic builds up, as it sometimes does in our cities these days. So the council decide what we're going to do to speed up the traffic is we're going to add an extra lane to both sides of the road. That doesn't make people go home. It doesn't make people go to work. It just means they get there faster. So in fact, adding a catalyst doesn't change the amounts of the substance, but it does change the rates. And have a look at what happens to the rate. Remember, neither is favored, so they both go up at the same time. Not one is more than the other. They both go up together. That's what happens when you add a catalyst. Cool, so I hope that's a helpful overview for you. Um, once again, practice is the way to get used to what these graphs do. All the best, have fun, cheers.